Okay, we're live on Facebook. All right. All right. Hello, Facebook. <laughs> hey, everybody out there. All right, this is Quick to Politic, the social commentary show. I am your host, Ernestine Lyons, and um, I have a very special guest here today. Um, so our guest grew up in Harper Woods. Well, I, I actually didn't know this. I just kind of see this guy just about everywhere in the, you know, community here in the Harper Woods, Detroit, Metro Detroit area, in the Gross Point communities. Um, he grew up to a working class family that experienced the typical hardship to, of American life um, and took an interest in politics. And, you know, today he has a bachelor's degree from, of course, the best university in the world, Wayne State University. Woo woo, my, my you know, major, uh, my, my alma mater as well. Um, and then he also works in municipal government, um, helping small businesses launch. Um, and it's in the city of, is it Oak Park? Yep, Oak Park. Okay. Oak Park, and he has previous experience uh, in political organizing, campaign management, uh, community, uh, government communications, and is currently the second vice president of the Gross Point Democratic Club. Welcome to the show, Colton Dale. All Thank right. you so much for having and, me. All right. All right. So did I miss anything? <clears throat> well, that was a good summary. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. I'm just going to delve right into our first question. But I do want to tell, you know, anybody out there watching in cyberspace, um, feel free to drop comments and ask questions. Um, we're going to be talking mostly about the future of the Democratic Party and, you know, local engagement and like how to get involved when you're, you know, still young and, you you know, the whole purpose of the show is really to foster that that sense of, you know, you can you can get involved because I always say I'm not really a politician. I'm just somebody who wanted to see change happen. So, um, so, so, so Colton, what sparked your interest in politics in particular? And, you know, um, tell us a little bit more about, you know, that journey. Sure. So this is a question that I get a lot. Um, I'm sure you get it often too. And, you know, I always tell people, I, I don't really know if I can pinpoint it to one thing. Um, it was sort of an, an area of growth for me. But um, one th if I have to point, pinpoint it on one thing, I guess I would have to look back at a, uh, it was an environmental science class that I took in my senior year of high school at Girls Point North. And, um, you know, I had a little bit of interest in politics before that. But when I took that class in and started to learn about uh, the environment, um, climate change, global warming, and um, how uh, we're not doing enough uh, to mitigate that massive, massive issue. Um, that's when I really thought, okay, this might be um, an area that I want to, uh, you know, delve into more. So um, I think that was, uh, that really sparked an, int an interest. Uh, and then I ended up, uh, like you said, uh, going to Wayne State University and got a bachelor and uh, bachelor's degree in political science. Um, I went on and do some organizing after that, and then uh, also got a master's degree in public administration from Wayne State as well. So um, it, it's interesting how one class in high school really kind of, um, you know, set off a whole host of other things uh, to, um, you know, make this trajectory for me. Thank you for thank you for that. Um, so so you said it was environmental change that you know really was the thing that you felt like you wanted to give your voice to, which started you down this path of you know political advocacy. You know, I think that's really interesting because um, I think that's that's kind of an issue that a lot of people really want to you know give voice to because you know we all care about the planet, and I know in Harper Woods we actually had to you know end our um, recycling program. And that's something that, you know, I've been you know, vocal with some of our local elected officials, whether in the Senate or the, 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 the House of Reps. Um, it's, you know, it's something that's really important. And I'm glad that that was the cause that kind of made you want to, you know, really, really dive right into it. So um, I do want to um, sort of ask a little bit more about like uh, the Democratic Party and, you know, of course, environmentalism and, you know, um, being an advocate for, you know, just making sure that, that climate change isn't something that's going to, you know, negatively impact all of us is kind of one of those things that you attribute to a democratic cause. And so speaking of them, um, we're, we're navigating a sea of, you know, social upheaval and systemic changes um, that, you know, we're, we're seeing protests and we're seeing, you know, a lot of civil unrest and 
how will the Democratic Party really, you know, be able to be the champion of, you know, the, the right way forward and being, you know, the voice of progressives, because it seems that the party is fractured. We have a lot of extremists, you know, on the far right, or at least I'm going to use the air quotes extremists on the far right. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, not far right. But you have a lot of, ex of extremists on the far left and, you know, you've got the Bernies and you've got, you know, the, the squad, the Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is and Rashida Tlaib and, you know, folks who are, you know, seen as the more extreme voice. And then you've got the moderate. So and in your estimation, what is going to be the future of the party? Because I do feel that in some ways we try to play to the moderates and and instead you know it seems that on the right um the it seems like the 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 more extreme voices are actually being heard and they're the ones that are beginning to represent what re the republican party actually stands for you know some of those very far right views but then with the democratic party we are trying to court folks who are you know on that that side of the spectrum where you know Know, they don't really see anything that's, be, that's being done wrong on their party side. Yeah. So, you know, so give, give us your, your, your standpoint and sure. you know, your thoughts on yeah. this. Yeah, sure. So I, I am a proud Democrat, lifelong. Um, you know, I, I think me and the Democratic Party it probably align, uh, maybe 99%. Um, in terms of um, this fractured nature that we're seeing, first of all, I I don't think it's as fractured as some pundits make it out to be. Um, and, and then secondly, I, I, I hate the word extremist um, for, for our side, at least. I don't, I don't know if we really have extremists on our side. We definitely have uh, people who are left of um, the uh, establishment um, and really seeking to uh, make changes now instead of incrementally. I think, the, uh, I think the other side has extremists. And I think, you know, those are the people waving uh, Nazi flags and and just uh, being racist and and sure. white supremacist in general. Um, I you know that being said, I don't think it's as fractured as some make it seem to be. Um, you know, and I think actually I'm a I'm a good uh, piece of evidence to that. Um, I you know I'm I'm a, a a Bernie supporter. I was a Bernie supporter in 2016. Um, I uh, I didn't initially. <laughs> I was hey I was organizing for Bernie uh, long before anybody um, really thought he had much of a chance. Uh, I was kind of out by myself and maybe a few other people, and then um, you know we did what we could to help Bernie in Michigan in 2016. And uh, this year, um, I, I didn't start out supporting Bernie just because I thought you know he, he was getting older. I wanted to see some some younger faces in there, um, but by the time our primary uh, you know, came around, it really kind of was a, a, a choice between Biden and, and Bernie. And I did vote for Bernie. Um, and I love Joe Biden. Uh, I think Joe Biden's a, a great nominee, but um, I'm, a, I'm a Bernie person. Um, but, you know, so so some might peg me as as being, a, you know, on, on the left side of the Democratic Party. But, um, you know, myself and so many others like me who may uh, be left of the establishment or left of what is, uh, you know, conventional wisdom in the Democratic Party. Uh, we're still working with the people in the Democratic Party who have been there for a long time. Um, you know, we're working within the systems, the processes, the people to make change, not just uh, societal change that we want to see, but also change within the Democratic Party itself. And I've seen a lot more people um, from different parts of the party work together than I have seen the opposite where they can't work together. And I, I think you see that all over the country. Um, I, I know I've seen that in Michigan here uh, with the Michigan Democratic Party. And I think um, it's no secret that the, the party is moving to the left. And I think also people who are who may be more moderate or older or have been in the party for a long time, they, had, they generally have done a good job of making way for the younger, more progressive voices. And I think that's a really um, good thing to see. I, I think it's uh, great for the party moving forward. Well, I think I think it's one, it's interesting that you said that, you know, um, about the support for Bernie, um, because I know I remember in 2016, um, I was, of course, a Hillary person. And I, I didn't, I'm just like, what is the appeal in Bernie? Um, but then I did buy a bumper sticker for him just to cut off the B because it's Ernie. And so I put Ernie 2016 <laughs> bumper sticker on the back of my car. Oh, I wasn't I even running it. for anything. Um, but I thought it was, um, you know, and then it was it was definitely Bernie all the way because I feel like um, him and Elizabeth Warren, I think they had, you know, just just this more 
down to earth approach. And I think it was more aligned with the way that young progressives um, view the future of the Democratic Party. And, um, you know, I, I, I do think that in some ways, um, you know, I, 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 would, I would have to push back on that as far as like um, the, the, the kind of divisions from within. I've heard things like Nancy Pelosi has made comments about, you know, the squad and then somebody, a reporter asked that same question about, um, you know, Speaker Pelosi, which you said there's divisions and, you know, you've got more radical, uh, you know, radical extreme voices like, you know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh, 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 and then you've got um, Ilhan Omar and Ayanna Presley, you know, and she, she's, her response was like, well, that's like three people and so <laughs> what? You know, and, and I, I have kind of seen this dismissiveness with her, but, you know, that's, I guess that's an aside. Um, but, you know, you, you do have those kind of, um, you know, movements from within a lot of other parties, you know, so. Sure. Yeah. Um, and and I, I don't, I'm not saying that there aren't divisions. Um, there, there obviously are. There's big differences on policy um, just within the Democratic Party itself. I just don't think it's as bad as, as some uh, pundits make it out to be. I really, I really don't. Um, and I think most people would agree the future of the party is left of what it is right now. I, I you know, I, I think that's, that's pretty obvious. Right. And I do think that with like, as opposed to, uh, you know, four years ago, I think, you know, Biden has definitely shown that he is more aligned with the rest of the party and, you know, just, just kind of the, the drastic changes. And I think, you know, I also think that uh, extremists is a misnomer as well, because, I think I think this is a time for more extreme approaches because you know what's been the the the, the approach for so long in politics um, on on the left has been you know something that's not necessarily moving the needle forward. So um, with that, I do want to shift gears and um, talk a little bit about your work in small business development. You work for the city of Oak Park, and um, it you you work in. Um, is it, you know, just more economic development or uh, just, just working with organizations like the SBA? Um, tell us a little bit about your, your work. Yeah, sure. So I've been in uh, municipal government for about three years now. Um, I started as an intern at the City of Oak Park. And uh, my first job uh, with them uh, outside of my internship was actually being their community engagement lead in communications. So for two years, I did that. Um, I was, um, you know, managing their Facebook website, press releases, press relations, um, things of that nature, and uh, making sure that we engaged with our community around just about everything. Uh, but just recently, um, about, uh, I think a little over a month ago now, I stepped into a new role, um, which more aligns with what I want to do nowadays. Um, it, it is, and the role that I'm in is, uh, it's kind of 50-50 uh, between economic development and planning. So uh, a lot of what I do is um, assisting my boss, who is the economic development director, with um, helping businesses start up, helping them grow, helping them find the resources they need, especially during the, the pandemic that we're in. Uh, a lot of, you know, for the last few months, a lot of what we've done is just help connect small businesses with grants and loans and other resources that they need to survive, basically. Um, and then the planning side of it is, um, you know, looking at zoning. Uh, we're redoing our zoning ordinance right now, uh, helping with uh, business licenses, um, and generally trying to uh, assist with the forward progress, um, you know, that the city has made over, over the last few years. Thank you. Thank you for, for explaining that a little bit more, because um, I, I also work in economic development. And, you know, I know that, you know, this is something that I ran for office in the city of Harper Woods on a platform of economic development. And I work for an organization called Build Institute. Um, and, you know, we go into different cities that are looking to, you know, really, really foster that sense of economic development and work with not only um, community associations and, you know, nonprofits that are all about economic development, but we help, you know, entrepreneurs. And so um, I do, I'm a firm believer that, you know, economic justice is social justice. So how can, you know, the Metro Detroit area and like, you know, all of our small business ecosystem, how can we continue to bolster and encourage inclusive innovation when it comes to that, that, that space of, you know, the built environment and, you know, that, that, innovation that catalyzes talent for economic and community development? Yeah. Um, great question. 
Uh, I, 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 I'm a believer in a regional approach. Um, you know, too often we have communities that want to just kind of operate in their own silos. Um, you see a lot of that in uh, Macomb County. And, uh, you know, something that comes to mind is, is um, regional transit. And, and just, uh, um, if I can cut in real quick, Oak Park sure. is in Oakland County. That's right. Correct. Isn't it? Okay. Yep. Uh, so Oak Park, yeah. So o Oak Park is 30,000 residents. It is, uh, it borders Detroit. It is in Oakland County, the uh, southeastern part of Oakland County. Um, uh, but yeah, so, you know, some of the successes that we've had in Oak Park um, were because we were working with other partners, working with other communities and thinking at a regional level, not just what's best for us, but what's best for our, our neighbors, uh, you know, what's best for Ferndale, what's best for um, Berkeley, what's best for Southfield, but more importantly, what's best for the city of Detroit and Metro Detroit as a whole. Um, so we've been, you know, looking to diversify the types of businesses we have. We have been investing in public infrastructure, um, making it, um, making our city a more bikeable and walkable community. And uh, these are the things that a lot of other communities in Southeast Oakland County are doing. Um, so it only makes sense that we all do it together. And I think when you do that, you, you, you're naturally going to foster a lot of the things that you're talking about, you know, more uh, better growth, um, more, you know, equitable growth and community development that includes everybody, not just, um, you know, not just big corporations or not just people who can afford uh, certain things. Thank you. Thank you for, for kind of... Um kind of just shedding some light on this whole regional approach because I do know that, um, you know, there are a lot of resources out there that maybe um, are maybe underutilized. I know that the Southeast Michigan Council of Governments has a lot of, you know, programming. They partner with the Michigan Municipal League and the Michigan Municipal League. It's just its own entity where, you know, they're really mm -hmm. good at, you know, bolstering that, you know, okay, we're going to educate you as, you know, uh, engaged citizens who want to do, you know, good things in your community or as appointed and elected officials who are, you know, getting in there and coming up with programs. And so, um, you know, I think it's, it's important to be able to build that like community wealth. And that's something um, I recently was, um, have been working with the Michigan Municipal League on. Um, and, and it's just really important to be able to, you know, create those systems for that shared community wealth, um, which kind of leads me into another question. Yeah, as you touched on that, you talked about, um, you know, just being able to reshape how a community, you know, fends for itself, how it creates programs around, you know, um, who is really given the opportunity for, you know, just building those 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 new things that you want to see so um yeah. i know you had participated earlier um during the pen in the very beginning of the pandemic in a um there was a black lives matter caravan that came through um you know the the gross points and the harper woods community yeah. and it's funny because that was the second time i ran into you and i just kind of waved and i'm like okay i need to get to know this kid because i see him everywhere yeah. and i know we're like four degrees of separation you know away from each other as far as like uh friend groups and things like that so um i kind of want to ask a little bit more about you know diversity and inclusion and then the future of you know just making sure that underestimated entrepreneurs are included in you know just some of these 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 conversations around how we build um, space for, you know, innovators, how we build space for, you know, startups and bent ups and, you know, just small businesses and who we uplift and um, just, just kind of what are your thoughts on the future of, you know, just equity and, you know, with regard to diversity and inclusions. I know, um, you know, being the second vice president of um, the Gross Point Demo Democratic Club and having this this economic um, sort of angle that you work in in uh, with other jobs and other capacities, you know, how what is what is your commitment to making sure that there is more, you know, different voices are heard and everybody's given a seat at the table as you put together these systems for, you know, the next decade, you know, because right. It's a, it's a time of a lot of social upheaval. So what is your commitment to? Sure, sure. So ju uh, just a quick note about that, um, the, the caravan, which I think was in May. 
Um, that was myself and, and one of my good, good friends, Shannon Byrne, um, whom I'm sure you know. Everybody knows Shannon nowadays. Um, I have never actually physically met her. Oh, I, you should, you should get her on the show next. She's, she's phenomenal. One of the hardest working people I know. Um, but, you know, we, when, um, I think it was, it was shortly after the death of George Floyd, um, you know, we noticed, you know, there wasn't anything going on in Gross Point in terms of a, a protest or a march or a demonstration. So I got with Shannon and we put that together because we really do believe that it's important not just to, um, you know, drive to downtown Detroit to protest, but to protest in our own community, which is uh, a, a predominantly white, predominantly affluent community to say, you know, we need to stand up too. We need to stand hand in hand with our black and brown brothers and sisters, uh, you know, in this, in this fight towards social justice. Um, because if you look at a lot of the, uh, the police brutality killings, they're happening in, in, in suburbs often. They're not, they're not happening in, in big cities or downtowns. Right. And this is why, honestly, personally, I do have to interject this and say that I think that um, a lot of the protests that are happening downtown, um, they're kind of taking away from like the bigger problems that could be addressed. And, Perfect. you know, I even know that me as a council person in the city of Harper Woods, I know I have had to look at how I step up and how intentional I am about, you know, just making sure there's more transparency here and working with, you know, our supporting, you know, programs that can make our law enforcement better and make sure right. that our people are protected because I recognize that that's where, you know, a lot of that discriminatory, you know, and systemic ingrained behavior is happening in the suburbs. So to, to protest downtown where, you know, you've got, you know, I think the a more, more, okay, more likely than not, you've got more black police officers. I'm, I'm not going to say it's all black police force in Detroit, but, you know, for, for a lot of, you know, suburban folks, and then also some Detroiters um, protesting downtown every day, you know, and it, I just think that in some ways there are bigger fights that are more important that need to be had other places. And you hit it right on the head when you were saying that like, you know, Gross Point needed to be, you know, active in this and to, to you know, start speaking out against a system that, you know, is problematic and, you know, start to address that because other than that, it's just going to be like, oh yeah, the, the protests are happening in Detroit and then they happen nowhere else. And then nobody, you know, acts for any type of accountability or right. speaks out against anything that's happening anywhere else. And so I know yeah. I've had to, you know, really look at like, okay, we need to create better systems. We need to have dialogues. And I'm not a big, not big on protests. I'm more big on let's have workshops. Let's have conversations. Let's have one-on-ones. And that's mm -hmm. my approach. So um, yeah, I think, you know, that's, that's really a good point about making sure that like the places where it's happening are the places that these, these, protest these demonstrations are yeah. happening right yeah and i you know i the, the, the i wanted to mention the the caravan and, and go back to that because i think that is uh just one example of um some of the things that i try to do in terms of um you know getting towards a more diverse and equitable community um that's you know some of the things that the girls point democratic club is doing um that's just one example you know but in terms of a commitment that i have i mean is, is the commitment there? Absolutely. I mean, this is top of mind when we plan almost anything uh, within the Girls Point Democratic Club. We want to make sure that, um, you know, we're not just <laughs> having a Democratic Club for Girls Point. Um, and actually, we are um, um, considering um, a little bit of a rebranding, possibly even a name change, because we don't want to just be Girls Point. You know, we have members from Harper Woods. Harper we have Woods members and Detroit. Yeah, so. East side of Detroit, exactly. So, and uh, we actually just held an event um, that uh, Shannon uh, helped put on um, at the Community Treehouse, which is in Jefferson Chalmers in Detroit, in which it was, you know, we had census information, um, election information, voter registration, and that was reaching out to a community that us as the Girls Point Democratic Club uh, typically didn't reach out to. Um, so we're trying to do more of that. Um, we want to expand our club, not just for the benefit of expanding and getting more members, but to make sure that we as a club are more inclusive and equitable in everything that we do. Um, so that is top of mind 
uh, when we plan a lot of these things and when we think strategically about the future of the club. I'm really glad that that's something because I don't know that Gross Point does have like nationally this history of, oh, well, they're not very welcoming. And, you know, I know that there have been organizations and they've been a, like, I know in the past maybe two years, there's been a wave of progressive candidates who have been elected in Gross Point um, who want to be more, you know, to, to change the optics. And, you know, so I think in these communities here on the east side, um, you know, we, we want to try to move in, especially as, as millennials in leadership and as more progressive folks. Um, I think we want to try to change the narrative. And this is something that I know I'm personally pushing for in Harbor Woods is, you know, a, just a whole different narrative and, you know, a, a message that, you know, is about, you know, just, just an inclusive branding and, you know, the way that we're really standing up for, you know, just, just bringing in and ushering a new era uh, with a new style of leadership. So, right. um, yeah, yeah. Thank you for that perspective. And, you know, that is something that I wanted to make sure that we, we touched on. Um, and so just kind of shifting gears. Um, so you have been a campaign manager, planning specialist, and active with the Democratic Party. Um, what is, what's next for you? Um, do you have design to, you know, on p public office? Do you want to run for, you know, something? Or do you think you're going to lean more into fixing, you know, economic systems and, you know, fostering more innovation and economic development? Sure. So, uh, you know, that's a, a lot going on in that question. <laughs> um, in terms of a career, I do want to stay in economic development. I really like what I do. I get a lot of pride out of helping small businesses grow, especially in the environment that we're in right now. Um, I think it's an incredibly important duty, and I see myself doing economic development for a long time. Um, that being said, do I want to run for office at some point, uh, or do I see public office in, in my future? I do. Um, I don't know when. Uh, when that is or, or for what seat that is. Um, I, I, you know, I'm a, I like to think I'm a patient person. Um, I see a lot of young people my age and even younger um, getting out and running for office. And that's fine. I would never discourage anybody from running for office ever. Um, but I do think, you know, it's always been my perspective that, you know, I want to get a bunch of life experience. I want to get career experience. I want to get my feet settled somewhere. Um, before I go run for office. And, and for me, the stars are going to have to align, I guess. Um, it's, it's, you know, running for office, being in politics, is, as you know, is a lot about timing. It's a lot about uh, making uh, really good decisions very quickly. Um, so, you know, do I want to run for office someday? Absolutely. Um, I just, I don't know when that will be. It could be, could be next year. It could be 40 years from now. I have no idea. Um, but uh, I do hope to someday. All right. All right. Well, thank you for, you know, all of those questions. And, you know, I've been keeping my quick to politics quick. Uh, they used to stretch into like hours, two hours. And um, so those are those are all of my questions. And thank you so much for coming on and having like a candid conversation, because um, I think one of the first times I interacted with you was um, there was a panel for um, giving endorsements for candidates who were running for office and yep. um, you know, I had interviewed, but I ran for a two year term. And so I do know that um, at that time, you know, the, the Gross Point Democratic Club wasn't necessarily giving um, endorsements for two year candidates. And right. so, um, but I do remember like having a whole series of questions asked and um, you were, you were there asking some of those uh, tough questions. So, yeah. Um, but yes, yes, I look forward to, you know, continuing to run into you. Um, out there and in this ecosystem, um, whether small business or like local politics here on the east side. Um, and, in you know, it's funny because you, you mentioned, you know, working closely with Oak Park. Um, I work with um, Ferndale is a built city and um, so is uh, the city of Hazel Park. So I work with mm -hmm. them um, through Build Institute. And so, um, you know, that, I didn't even realize that it was that that close of a connection there. Um, so Thank you to the audience out there. And if you guys have any questions, um, feel free to, you know, let me know. I'm just going to check and make sure that nobody dropped any comments. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much for, for coming on. And this thank is Politic. And for all of you out there watching, 
Click to Politic also has um, a podcast. So if you, you know, prefer to listen to this episode while you're driving, then you can also do that. So um, be sure to look for that on Apple Podcasts. Um, so thank you for coming on the show. And we are. Thank you so much. Stopping the live. Thank you.